Hi there. Welcome back. You're listening to The Everglade Chronicles, a reading. I'm Garrett Shave, the author. Today, I'll be reading Chapter 11, Storm the Keep. The final showdown is about to begin, and the gang leads the Liberation Army towards Queen's Summit. Who will survive to wear the meadow's crown? Now let's get started. I'm going to start today's episode with talking about the Ask the Author mini-episode that's coming next week. Do you have some burning questions about the book or the author that you want answered? Find the post promoting this episode and ask your questions. Find us on Instagram or Facebook. The mini-episode will take place next week, so get to writing those questions in the comments. Time is almost up. Now let's actually begin this chapter. Nightfall came to the meadow, and as the battle dispersed, final numbers were tallied. Children and teens went off home, but the major players on each side remained. Queen's Summit was aglow with candles and flashlights, so we knew they were up to something. Most of the Queen's major men remain alive, Mark informed us. Skylar and Kevin have not been killed just yet. The final numbers show that we are in the lead, Ben told us. The Liberation Army had marked their weapons with our colors, and those who were killed in battle had to throw down their weapons and restart. Ben and the others had been counting and found that the Queen had more thrown down in the field. We are almost ready for the final siege of the Queen's Keep, Sassy Cassie said firmly. Us girls will storm the Keep, firing off our guns, Cora said, excited. That should scare the pants off the guards, I think. A small brigade will then rise and invade, I said. Swords and weapons brandished, we must take Queen's Summit by tomorrow afternoon. Why is tomorrow so important? Matthew asked. Because, silly, Kale laughed. Monday is the last day of school for most of us. If the Queen is given the chance, she will use that day to recruit everyone she can find to secure her throne. The crown must roll down the hill, I said figuratively, although the actual crown rolling down the hill would signify the end of the Queen's totalitarian reign. Good point, Cassidy mused. We might have to do that. So the main plan has us depending on the girls firing off their guns? Mark asked. Then the rest of us will storm in and prepare for the battle? Precisely, I remarked. We think the loud noise will scare them, and scaring gives us a fraction of a second to act. Did anyone care to think if they're prepared and have guns? Ben said. We took that into account, Cora remarked. We have shields for a reason. I don't think we should bicker about this, I said firmly. We cannot have holes in the plan, nor can we have doubts. Tomorrow we shall stick with this plan and take action. Abby did not speak to me at all that evening. She had also left before me in the morning, and as I dressed as Isis, I could not help but think about how this would affect our relationship even when Caitlin Hardy was no longer the queen. Abby would give it her all today, and she would fight till we wrung her neck. Sassy Cassie and Cora were waiting for me on the birch trail dressed in their soldier gear. In addition to my pigtails and black mask, I had worn white capris and a tangerine top. Cora was holding a pile of plastic shields she had bought at the dollar store, and Cassidy had a number of plastic pistols and rifles strung on a long string around her arm. Her pockets were likely filled with caps. I myself had a blocky cap pistol in my back pocket in case I needed it. We shall call this Freedom Day, Cora said as we walked. That or Liberation Day, I laughed. How about Storming of the Bastille Day? We all laughed. It was a dark and devilish laugh to mirror today's childish events, with a severe turning point in French history. But we were trying to make light of the situation. The Bermuda Bridge was covered in Liberation soldiers. Mark and Ben were already there, clambering and organizing the kids. Tyler was handing out weapons of all kinds from his stockade, and Cassidy went over to add the guns and the sheets of caps. As I looked out over the meadow and towards the ruined royal city, I noticed that the queen and her band of men had put red pennons on sticks into the ground. I'm assuming those red flags mean the meadow is hers, Mark asked. The blood-red flags flapped in the breeze, and I squinted my eyes in anger. I should think so, I said, gritting my teeth. Cassidy stood on a wooden crate and called for quiet. There might have been forty kids all lined up, ready for battle. She whistled with her fingers, and everyone was silent. Today, she began her triumphant speech. We begin our assault of Queen's Summit. It shall be a good battle. And I encourage all of you to fight your hardest. I myself would like to personally invite Jess, I meant Isis, 
up to the stand to say a few words. I was paralyzed for a moment. I had never really publicly spoken before, except perhaps in front of a small group of teens in my class. I had certainly never given a military speech. I walked through the sea of kids, and they all touched me. Many smiled, and many gave hard faces of encouragement. Isis is the meadow's hero, Cassidy said as I stood near her. Clad in black and feline-like, she has helped us reach the turning point. Without her assistance, I do not think my agency would have swelled this large. I do not think we would have ever been able to say that we took on the queen. The queen! Isis has really been a moving force, an unstoppable object in our quest for liberty and equality. The mass of children clapped as I rose to the crate, and I swallowed hard. I did not know what to say. I suppose I should start by thanking you all for your undying support, I murmured. Without the stand-up attitude of those at the bottom, the queen and her cronies would not be trembling in their boots as we speak. One would never think to question authority, especially the authority of a rueful queen, such as the one our meadow has been scorned with. When I think back to my first season here, so many years ago, there was a just king. His name had been Thomas, and while he has outgrown the meadow, we have not outgrown his memory. Caitlin, as she was known in those days, used to be a revolutionary like us. She had different ideals, however, and with the help of her friends, she overthrew Thomas, just as we are about to overthrow her today. We must do what is right and end the reign of this unjust queen. Simply do the best you can do, and good shall prevail. Caitlin had been a just queen once, but the power has gone to her head. We must end this. The sea of children let out a holler and a cheer, and I blushed under my mask. Isis shall reveal herself, I said, hoisting off my mask. I am Jessica Walker. The crowd never stopped to gasp or gravitate to a state of shock. They were all caught up in the fun of war and the greatness of battle. I waved my mask in the air as we cheered, and I knew triumph would be ours by day's end. The Liberation forces moved quickly towards the city. Along the way, we plucked flags from the ground and tossed them aside. Everyone wore a look of determination and a look of victory. We were going to win this today. I knew that for sure. There was a brief battle in the royal city. Some of Lord Schuyler's cumbersome forces were idly waiting for us, but they doubted our army's strength. They were overtaken within minutes and surrendered unconditionally. We shall take these kids as prisoners, Cassidy instructed. The army moved on. We stopped before Queen's Summit at the bottom of the hill. The towering landmass seemed to mock us, for in each of our plans the hill was an impossible obstacle. While we all could climb the thing, the slow kids would be pushed behind, and the fast kids would arrive first. The army would be jumbled and uncoordinated, Cassidy had said during our planning. Agreed, Mark remarked. After a few moments of delicate deliberation, we all agreed to send the army in waves. The strongest children and the ones with the most shields would go first and hold off the attack while the next group moved into place. This would continue until the entire army was atop the hill and ready to storm the castle. Cora had volunteered to go up first. When we asked why, she simply said, to scope the place out. In a tactical move, Cora would allow herself to be captured in order to see what we were up against. Naturally, Ben asked how she would escape. Simple, really, Cora explained. I'll pull Lord Schuyler and say I've crossed over. I'll feed them some false information, and when I'm reunited with Lady Chloe, I'll slip away. Easy as my mother's pumpkin pie. It was a risky move, but Cora was no fool. We all lingered near the bottom of the hill, wary of an attack. We had hardly any intel on the Queen. Security around her castle had been tight ever since the acorn attacks, and getting a spy in was near impossible. At a quarter to one, Cora made the ascent up the hill. We heard nothing for a very long time, and then, almost twenty minutes later, a small brigade descended the hill. Lord Schuyler and Lord Kevin led the band of five teens, all brandishing swords. Schuyler himself looked impressive, a red velvet cape draping his shoulders and a pointed hat upon his head. We all braced ourselves, but Mark assumed it was an emissary. Only five teens and the lords themselves, he observed. This is no attack, but an offering. 
the front line of our army were wielding plastic pikes, and they lowered them at the band's approach. Lord Schuyler held up a hand, letting us know he intended peace. Fine afternoon, isn't it, my lord? Sassy Cassie remarked rudely. She approached him but stayed within reach of her pikemen. Oh, it is, he said shortly. What brings you down here, away from your lavish perch? She asked, placing her hands on her hips. I walked over to her with Mark, Ben, and Chris at my tail. Her radiance wishes to offer one last proclamation of peace, he told us frankly. This is the Queen's royal decree, that you lay down your arms and return to your kilns and your fields, to your homes and to your places of work. This revolt goes against the Queen's rule and is treason in the highest regard. It is nice to know the Queen is willing to negotiate, Mark said. Negotiate nothing, Schuyler growled. You are all in violation of the Queen's laws and must refrain from this disgusting display of anarchy at once. She is willing to spare most of you if you are able to stand down and obey her reign as Queen of Everglade. Cassidy gave him a brazen look, one that might have set him on fire. She gripped her fists and gritted her teeth. We shall do nothing of the sort. Pardon? Schuyler replied rudely. You will continue to disobey your sovereign? You will all lose. Back off, Schuyler, or you will feel the burn of our swords, she hissed. The Liberation Army stands for everything the Queen has thrown away. The rights of the children in this meadow must be forefront, and the Queen herself has broken the natural law of things by going against the very people who hold her on her throne. Without us, there is no kingdom. There is no Queen. Since she continues to be a sorry sod and a baby, we will crush her and her forces like a Dixie cup. Schuyler and his troops stood back as the gathering of children clapped and hollered with determination. The children with pikes were poking Schuyler and his group of teens. They scrambled to escape and dodged their way up the hill. First group, let's move up, Cassidy yelled. Everything went as smooth as marble during the afternoon. The large group of kids made their way up the hill and we were met with very little resistance. The remaining forces that were loyal to the Queen were dwindling, and she really only had the home field advantage at this point. I walked up the hill, huffing and puffing alongside Ben and a few others. When we reached the top, a very long line of eighth graders were standing guard. They were as still as statues, dressed in plastic chain mail from the dollar store, and had Roman gladiator masks on to cover their faces. Each of the seven of them were very tall and thin, but carried a variety of weaponry. The two tallest, who were the Queen's personal guards, carried their trademark Halloween scythes and axes. The rest had plastic mallets, maces, and blades. The final frontier, Tyler swallowed hard. Beyond them lies the Queen. Even against an army, these eighth graders would be formidable. They were the Queen's strongest men, the toughest of the tough. As we gathered and stood watch, my sister and Ryan emerged from the adjacent bushes. It appeared he had survived the gunshot wound, that or he had restarted and immediately joined to the Queen's side. Abby glared at me and I glared back. They began talking to the guards, in hush mumbles too far for us to hear. Beyond them was the open field that Caitlin often used as her throne room. I could see the empty wicker throne beyond the boys, and the cooler in which she had kept her pink lemonade. Beyond that was the old tree fort that was barely used, but we all figured Venus would hold up in there till the very end. It was likely that Cora was in there too, with Lady Chloe, Lord Kevin, and the rest of the Queen's dull royal court. I wasn't really expecting this, Cassidy mumbled, but if this is all that Venus has left, then we are golden. We have triple their forces. But these are no ordinary boys, Matthew piped up from behind. I have gym class with these guys, and they are tough and strong, very muscular. Bring forth the case of water balloons, Cassidy insisted. We must distract them. That is our only way to secure victory. Once they are soaked, it'll be easy to overtake them. Madison and a girl named Christine stood forward with the wooden crate lined with balloons. They were all different colors, and Madison assured me that some were filled with vinegar instead of water. Another smaller boy handed Mark a bow and arrow. His plastic arrow was neon purple. He drew it back and fired symbolically towards the boys. Unfortunately, the arrow knocked Ryan in the head, and he fell to the ground again.
We all gritted our teeth, and we knew the battle had begun. The eighth graders did not move, and they began to shuffle when the water balloons began to fly. Shields were cracked, boys and girls fell. The battle was beginning to heat up. I danced around one of the tallest guards and tossed water balloons at him left and right. He only seemed blinded by the water, not worried. He was, however, wielding a mace rather madly. At once, I threw one at his face. The water splashed all over him, and while he cried and cleaned his face, I pushed him down. Laughing, I looked over at Mark, who was dueling with a tall boy with a long blade. The eighth graders were severely outnumbered. As I took a moment to glance around at the battle, I couldn't help but notice the sheer amount of kids fighting. One guard was toppled by three kids and swatted with foam swords. Another was cornered by five girls wielding cap guns. Cassidy was sword fighting her life away, slashing and bashing with intense fury. My sister, along with Lord Schuyler and Lord Kevin, joined the fray as the sun settled near the horizon. The orange and yellow glow was blinding, but the battle continued. I found myself staring at my sister, who was staring right back at me. I knew it would come to this, you and I, battling, I said. Abby nodded and drew her sword from her sheath at her belt. I nodded at Kale, who tossed me a plastic samurai sword. You simply must understand I am only doing what I think is right, she said, her tone oddly forgiving. I knew my sister did not want to fight me, but she had to. She was standing up for what she believed in. Then allow me to say, I began, let the best girl win. It was hardly difficult to slash and parry at my sister. We had often fought as younger girls, but I did not think we would ever be dueling for a kingdom. Her moves were brash and strong, the way Lord Schuyler and the rest at the military bureau had taught her. She was a military girl, a tough leader. She might have sat in on some meetings, even made some battle plans for the war we were all fighting in. Likewise, most of my skill came from the brief training Tyler and Matthew had offered me. Even Cassidy, who was an unusually gifted swordswoman, taught me a few tricks. We danced with blades for what seemed like hours. Every time we touched, the plastic clank would ring out across the field. Hardly a move was missed, and nearing the end we were both becoming exhausted. Much of the battle around us had ceased. The eighth graders were exhausted and threw down their weapons. Yet the rest of them allowed us to continue our sibling rivalry, dashing and slashing as we may all evening. This sword fight has proven nothing, Abby said at last, tossing her blade aside. I came here to fight you today, hoping you would change your mind. I see now that that isn't the case. We only wish for everyone to be happy, I said to her. A just ruler on the throne will allow all of us to prosper, and we can go back to having a grand and great meadow. Do not listen to such mockery, Ryan growled from the ground. He too was exhausted, but he was soaking wet. Venus is the only true ruler here. Abby looked confused, unsure of who to believe. I suppose I shall sit this one out. I cannot choose a side like this. Being neutral is simply the same, Skylar lashed out. If you are not with Venus, you are against her. In a quick and unstoppable moment, Skylar jabbed his blade at Abby's leg. It made contact, and she moaned. The entire moment seemed to happen in slow motion as she tumbled to the ground. Such a wound might be fatal, and she might never walk again. I ran towards her as fast as I could, flanked by Tyler and Matthew. Cassidy ran over to me with Madison at her side. My leg, she said, feeling her jeans. I've been stabbed. You'll be all right, Madison said, rubbing her leg. Your tyranny has gone on long enough, Skylar. Matthew hissed. I looked up just as Matthew slashed Skylar with his sword, sending the major domo backwards. In a dramatic, poetic way, the queen's right-hand man was sent to the ground. Skylar was shaking his hands, gasping at his open chest wound. Tyler emerged from behind his friend and finished with a fatal blow. He only light jabbed the major domo in his tummy, but the impact was enough to kill the general. Skylar let out a groan and proceeded to make dying noises. He would now have to restart and begin anew. He would no longer be the Lord Skylar we knew and hated. When Abby had been drawn away by Madison and a few other girls, Cassidy called me over. While Skylar lay on the ground, we noticed a group of kids exiting the treehouse. First came the Queen's butler, followed by two guards, the Herald, Lady Chloe, Lord Ashton, Lady Alice, and finally the Queen. 
Caitlin Hardy was in her formal regalia, a red summer dress, her plastic crown atop her head, and her scepter in her hand. Around her neck was a faux fur-lined cape of red velvet. Her hands were gloved with white satin. She looked unimpressed and oddly omnipotent. I wondered if she would surrender or continue the fight. The rest of her dreary court looked sad. Cora then emerged from the treehouse and was escorted between the two guards. They had seen through her plan, and she was a prisoner. Your little friend here was not too clever, the queen hollered across the field. Do you think I am silly, Cassidy? You think I would seriously believe that Cora Hastings would just cross over here, just to be with her beloved Lady Chloe? What a senseless plan. Look around you, my queen, Sassy Cassie retorted. You're finished. The game is over. At first, Queen Venus said nothing, then snapped her fingers. She took off her red velvet cape and smoothly handed it to her butler. She then tossed her gloves to the ground. The, the herald produced a plastic saber, a thin rapier from a black scabbard. She took it with a resting, angry face and plodded to the center of the field. Then we shall duel, you and I, she said firmly. Cassidy smiled. Even if I am killed in this battle, we will still be victorious. I will have died for my cause, and your reign shall be ended anyway. Why are we dueling, if your loss is imminent? The queen touched her blade with admiration and waved it about in the air. A slight breeze caught her auburn hair, and she looked more triumphant than evil in that single moment. I've never been fond of you, sassy Cassie, she admitted. You've caused this kingdom so much grief, and me as well, so much unneeded difficulty. I only see this duel as a way of getting back at you. Ha! Cassidy grinned. How ironic. I see this duel as a way of getting back at you. Caitlin smirked. Stop being cheeky then and let's duel. Perhaps so, but you already know the outcome of this, Cassidy said, touching her sword. I do not know why you smile, why you smirk when you know this is all ending. The reign of Queen Venus has come to an end. You know this. Can a queen not have one last final satisfaction? The satisfaction in ending you, precious Cassidy? I watched as Sassy Cassie gripped her fists again. She gripped the sword and went to the center of the field. The queen's butler hurried along to the center as well, to officiate the match. The queen shoved him aside, and sadly he went and rejoined the royal party. I stared as the two girls locked eyes and moved around in a circle. The breeze continued entangled in both their hair. The meadow was eerily quiet. The former head of a crumbling kingdom was facing off against the strongest girl I knew. You're taking your time, Caitlin said, lashing out strongly. Cassidy was quick to dodge. I'm having fun, aren't you? The duel carried on in this fashion for a while. Often only one would lash out or make a stab, but the other would dodge effectively. Each time they pranced in a circle, saying something witty at each other. Each time they came around again. Well, this isn't very fun, Caitlin mocked, yawned at last. I agree, Cassie replied. Before she could say much else, the queen was lashing at her strongly. It took all of Cassidy's power to dodge and parry. The queen was a talent at this sort of thing, something no one seemed to know. The eyes of all the children were focused on her speed and her stamina, something that did not seem to yield. Even Sassy Cassie herself was having trouble keeping up. You thought I was all fun and games, Caitlin giggled maniacally, a simple-minded ruler who knew nothing of swords or shields. Well, you are sorely mistaken. I see that now, Cassidy remarked, holding up her blade to catch a blow. Caitlin's face let out a Cheshire grin. Her teeth looked sharp. She was holding Cassidy now with all her strength, her rapier pressing on Cassidy's defensive sword. I thought the plastic might crack or snap, but it held tight. I knew I would get the better of you, Venus hissed with evil joy. My last final judgment as queen of this realm will be ending the rebel sassy Cassie. Oh, how delightful! Grab your katana and your favorite kimono. Starting in 2024, the podcast begins the second novel, The Tale of the Cloverleaf Lord. Who is the Clover Lord? Find out January 2024. That concludes Chapter 11, our readings for this week. Join me next time for the Ask the Author mini-episode. 
This is the final call for questions. Find the post promoting this episode or the special Ask the Author posts to list your burning questions. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Shimmer by Captures provides the music. Find us online on Facebook by searching The Everglade Chronicles or at Everglade Chronicles on Instagram. I appreciate your support. If you're interested in purchasing any of the Everglade Chronicles novels, you can find them exclusively on Amazon. Thank you and see you next week.